All right. You will need a lot. You will need Bibles tonight. And your Bibles have been taken up. Remember, they were taken up this past time. Did anybody bring a Bible? Did anybody bring Bibles? Guys, after all of that this past weekend, you still didn't bring your Bibles to church? I've given Bibles to so many of you. Bring your Bibles to church. Please, please bring your Bibles to church. Mr. Keith, would you save them and go into the old choir room and there is a box of Bibles in there. Guys, if you cannot count the cost to pick up a Bible on your way out of the door, how in this world do you think you're going to count the cost if suffering ever comes? Guys, bring your Bibles. Please bring your Bibles to church. Please, please, please. If you need a Bible, I'll give you one. But please bring your Bibles to church. Okay, so last week, last week we started a study and we're going through spiritual beings and we started talking about angels last week. You guys remember how we were talking about angels last week? Yeah. Now angels are very different than what we think of in uh, pop culture and things like that. Thank you, Mr. Keith, for bringing in our box of Bibles. If you need a Bible, if you need a Bible, he is coming around for you to have them. But please, please bring your Bibles with you next Wednesday. Bring your own Bible with you. Learn how to navigate your own Bible. Please, please, please bring your own Bible. If you don't have one, I'll get one to you. I have Bibles. I will give them to you. Everyone needs a Bible. Please, please, please bring your own Bibles. But we started looking at angels last week. We started talking about how they're different from the way everything in pop culture tells us. Now, when I was a... Uh, let's see here. It was back in the 90s. I was growing up. I was still in grade school. And there was a movie that came out. All right, and this was the name of the movie. It was called Angels in the Outfield. All right? Angels in the Outfield. Now, this is what Angels in the Outfield was all about. Angels in the Outfield was about a little boy who was growing up in the foster care system. And this little boy in the foster care system, he is wanting to be restored uh, to his dad. And his dad says, they're, they're, they were Angels fans, the baseball team. And he says... He says, Dad, when are we going to be a family again? He says, the way it's looking, and I say when the angels win the pennant. All right? Which it, the angels just were not going to win it. Okay? They were a terrible, terrible baseball team. And that night, and that, and that night, <laughs> that night, this little boy played by, what's his name again? It's Robin. Joseph Gordon Levitt. He's, he, was, he, 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 uh, he prays, God, maybe you can help the angels win some baseball games. And you know what God does? God decides that He's going to send angels to help the angels win a baseball games. Alright? So... We've got to ask the question, okay? Pop culture identifies all these things. They, listen, angels are all these things. They look like this. They do this kind of stuff. We need to ask the question, well, what do angels do? And I'm going to ask you, do angels help baseball players win baseball games? I don't know. Well, do you think it maybe looks something like this? I've got a video. You think maybe it looks like this? That's, that's Joseph Gordon Levitt. That's Robin, by the way. Oh, All right? I don't know. I don't know if he's from the Lightning Thief or not. All right? So let's see if maybe what angels do looks like this. Perhaps. Maybe. Sort of. It doesn't look exactly like that stilled image. Huh. Does it not play him? There we go. That 
That's Matthew McConaughey, by the way. No, no, he gets help from angels. And only this child can see it. Now watch, here we go. So what do angels do? Do you think they do stuff like that? No. 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 I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, they, they might could do that. But do you think that that's an accurate, is that an accurate description or display of angels? I would say no. So if angels don't help baseball players win their games, if they aren't coming around to do that kind of stuff, we need to ask the questions, well, what do angels do? First thing we need to talk about is something that they don't do, okay? A lot of people think of, of angels in these terms that angels, uh, they, they more often think of angels like these beautiful women, these ladies who are very kind looking and very caring and compassionate. You guys ever seen um, images where, where it's a, uh, an angel is kind of a, is angelic and beautiful and it's, it's depicted more like a woman? Have you guys ever seen illustrations like that? Yeah. Um, angels are not described in those terms. They're not described in those terms at all. Typically, they are described only as uh, having uh, more masculine features uh, or features that just defy what we can even wrap our minds around. We looked at that a little bit last week. All right, so what do angels do? Well, first of all, we need to say that angels do not marry, okay? Angels don't marry, and the reason we know that angels don't marry is because we don't have a description of boy angels and girl angels. We don't have angels that are meeting together. It's not that you have families of angels and all of a sudden they're saying, hey, my little angel buddy, I want you to one day grow up to be a good angel to go down there and help baseball players. Nothing like that. So let's look up the Bible verses. Angels do not marry. All right, Matthew 22, 30. Uh, Andre, Luke 20, 34 through 36. All right. So what do angels do if it's not helping baseball players? What do they do? Well, the first thing you do, they're not married. They're not making families. They're not raising children angels or anything like that. So whenever you're ready, read Matthew 22, 34. There is neither marriage nor none given in marriage, but they are like the what? Angels in heaven. They do not marry are not given into marriage. What about Luke 20, 34 through 36? Okay, it says that they're like angels. They do not marry. They're not given unto marriage. So angels, first of all, we have to know, angels aren't doing family life the way people do. People can have families. They can raise children. Angels don't do that. So we need to go ahead and distance ourselves from this idea that you've got that you've got. Uh, some angels are the warrior types that you see in the Bible. Some angels are the nice, compassionate kind that we see depicted like ladies in, um, inside of uh, some drawings. We need to get our minds away from the idea that you've got these little... Have you guys ever seen images where you've got these, these children or these little like babies with wings on and those are supposed to be like little angels? We've got to get away from that mindset, okay? 
Angels don't have families. They're not that kind of a thing. Okay, so what is it that they do? What do they do? If they do not marry, what do they do? Okay, well, angels do carry out some of God's plans. The first thing, or maybe the most prominent thing we see that they do in the Bible, is they bring God's message. All right? So someone look up Luke 1, 11 through 19. You go for that one. I want, uh, Casey, will you raise your hand? I want you to do Acts 8, 26, and then I want you to go to chapter 10, verses 3 through 8, and verse 22. And you want to take chapter 27 of Acts, verses 23 through 24? Yeah? All right. So they bring God's message. We see this a lot. So Luke chapter 1, 11 through 19, read that for us whenever you get there. All right, after 400 years of silence, now God, after the book of Malachi was written, God didn't speak to people for 400 years. No message from God, nothing like that. No prophecies, no prophets. And after 400 years of silence, He breaks that silence by sending an angel to Zechariah, saying you're going to have a child. His name's going to be John. And he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. So an angel does deliver messages from God. What about Acts chapter 8, verse 26? After Philip and the angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip was sent an angel, he was given a message. All right, so we've got an angel delivering messages to Peter and Cornelius. And then what about chapter 27, verses 23 through 24? Again, we see angels delivering messages from God. They carry out some of God's plans. And we see them here, they're delivering messages for God. But what else do they do? Is that all that they do? Is they just, they, just, they just deliver messages? That's the only action they do? No. They also carry out some of God's judgments. Alright, I need 2 Samuel 24, 16 and 17. Go for it, Josiah. 2 Chronicles 32, 21. Go for it, Kaylee. And Acts 12, 23. Uh, Jonathan, you, you take that one. Alright? So, they carry out some of God's judgments. That's a big deal, guys, that He's going to carry out judgments. Alright? So, whenever you're there, 
read 2 Samuel 24, 16 and 17. Yeah, chapter 24, verses 16 and 17. So listen to this. That is a very different picture than what we think of when we think of angels. God pronounced judgment against David, against the people of Israel, and He sent an angel to go strike people down. Now, was that an unkind thing? No, they had been wicked. They had done very evil and wrong things. We don't have time to go through all of what they were going through, but Understand, God was going to exercise judgment upon them for their wickedness, and He sent an angel to carry it out. What about 2 Chronicles 32, 21? An angel was striking people down. He was striking down Assyrians. They were, a, they were a very wicked people who were often rising up against the Israelites. And an angel was striking them down because of God had pronounced judgment on them. What about Acts chapter 12, verse 23? Struck him down and worms ate him. Guys, this, this is not a little angel that's going to fly out of heaven, going to pick up a baseball player so he catches a ball, and then going to high-five each other and disappear in glitter and sparkles. That's not the image that's going on here. So what do they do? They carry out God's, some of God's plans. They bring messages. They carry out God's judgments. Some of their judgments. But what else do they do? They also patrol the earth as representatives. So I'm going to read this one. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 10-11. through 11. And it says this, So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered, the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest. So very likely, at this moment, angels are on patrol even in this room. patrolling the earth as representatives. They're representing, to, they're representing the message of God, the judgments of God, the peace of God. They're representing the kingdom of God, the army of God. And we are likely right now in the same room with angels that are on patrol. That's... Uh, Odd thing to consider, isn't it? So how many of them on the patrol are ticked off that you've been playing with your phone today? Or even during the service tonight? I'm not going to ask you. I actually ask you that question. That's an interesting thing to consider though, isn't it? What else do they do? Well, they carry out war against demonic forces. Now, also back in the 80s, there was a book that came out written by a guy named Frank Peretti. It was called This Present Darkness. And it's actually a really 
really fun book to read. It's not entirely great, biblically speaking. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not really bad or, or awfully wrong, but I disagree with some points of it. But it's all about this angelic force fighting, among, fighting against this demonic force. And it's pretty intense. So I need someone to read Daniel 10, 13. Go for it, Josiah. You want, uh, Jonathan, you want Revelation 12? And uh, Anthony, do you want Revelation 20? Okay. All right. So what angels do? They carry out war against demonic forces. Now, you guys know what demonic forces are, right? You all know what demonic forces are? All right. We are going to cover demons. We're going to start that kind of, even kind of at the end of our time today. But we're really going to cover demons uh, in the next couple of weeks even more. But these angels, the ones that are carrying out God's plans or delivering His messages or uh, patrolling the earth as representatives, they are warring against demonic forces. So Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 tells us what? Yeah, Michael, one of the princes, and that's the archangel, Michael, came against those rulers of Persia, which would have been, he was fighting with demonic forces that were against the people of Israel. He was delayed for a time, but he got there after much warring and fighting. What about Revelation 12, 7-8? There was a war in what? Heaven. Angels and demons fighting against each other. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. So this is a, and we'll get to this as we study the book of Revelation, this is a, a look at the end times things, but you see that angels, even at the end of time, before God makes everything new and renewed again, they're at war with each other. This is a description of a war between angelic beings and demonic forces. And by the way, when I was growing up, there was a, uh, there was a, a lot of talk about how these demons, these demonic forces like Satan in particular, that Satan was this big, bad, demonic thing. And he is. He is. And it was always talked about how Jesus would be fighting and, and, and duking it out with Satan. And that, that Jesus was duking it out and He was having to give it everything He's got and, and Satan was giving it all that He's got. And at the end, Jesus would always win. And everyone would be like, yeah, that's awesome. That's actually not the way the Bible describes it. If Jesus goes to war, when Jesus goes to war against any force, demonic, human, whatever it is, they don't duke it out with Jesus. They get trampled under. You've got angels fighting. Jesus is God the Son. He's He's not, it's not even a chance he loses. You guys get that through, your, through, through our minds. We've got to get that through our minds. All right? What else do they do? Well, they glorify God for his plan of salvation. Now, this is an interesting, they glorify God for his plan of salvation. It's a plan that they're not included in. Read Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Who wants that one? Go for it, Kayla. Who wants Luke 15? Uh, Kaylee. And then I want you to take Ephesians 3.10, okay? They glorify God for His plan of salvation. So whenever you're there, read Luke chapter 2, verse 14 for us. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they glorified God because He had sent Jesus to be the Savior. They glorified God because salvation was being brought through a child. Luke 15. Who had Luke 15? There is joy amongst the angels of God over one sinner who repents, over one person who is saved from their sin. What about Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10? Guys, they rejoice. They glorify God because God has given salvation. God has given salvation. But has He given salvation to the angels? Has He given salvation to angels? He has not. But they rejoice that there is salvation and that it's through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, are angels better than humans? Now, well, I was always told, or I was not always told, but I was told by one of my great aunts while growing up that one day, if, or she would say that, that if you do good things, God puts a little tally mark over in your little column and says, here, this tally mark means that you're just one step closer to being an angel. And then when you sin, the tally mark will be erased. All right? And the idea there was that one day when you die, you become a what? An angel. That's not what the Bible says, though. Um, when my little boy... Uh, died, and he, we buried him, and, and it was a terrible, terrible time, a lot of people said, well, now he's just an angel in heaven. No, he's not. Are angels better than humans, or does God like angels more than us? Does He like <laughs> angels more than humans? Well, listen to this, guys. Angels are never said to be in the image of God. Never. In fact, read Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, and then verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Who would like to read Genesis 1 for us? Genesis 1, 26 through 27. I saw your hand first, and you're going to take Genesis 9, Josiah. All right. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. So whenever you're there, go ahead and read it, read it for us. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created in his image, not angels, according to the creation narrative. What about Genesis 9 6? Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. God made man in his own image, not, not angels. And it's never said that angels are in the image of God. It's never even said that angels are the Son of God. There's a lot of people who sit there and say that, that, that like in the example of Job, like when, when you've got. Uh, it says the sons of God met together. A lot of people sit there and say, well, that's, that's angels, that there's some sort of heavenly meeting and all these angels have met with God. That's, that's not it. Angels are not a son of God. In fact, the author of Hebrews tells us that no angel has ever been called a son of God. So are angels better than humans or does God like them more? No. We are more like God than the angels are. That's interesting to consider. Well, what else? Also, we need to know that God will one day give us authority over the angels. Do you guys know that? We'll actually be in charge or have authority over the angels. Someone read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Go for it, uh, Anthony, whenever you get there. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Do you you not know that we are to judge angels? That we have authority over the angels? We can exercise judgment over the angels? That's talking about last times things. That we will have judgment over angels? Not only that... That's not just a one day that we're going to have authority over angels, but angels already serve us today. Hebrews 1.14, I'll read that for us. It says this, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? They serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. They already serve us. It's in a lot of neat and interesting ways. We see that they help us through our days. They help us. Um, certainly Michael came to the aid of, of the Israelites. Earlier we read that they go to war with demonic forces, things that we cannot go to war with. What about this one? Do I have a guardian angel? Do y'all think? What do you think? Do we have guardian angels? What do y'all think? I mean, there's not, I'm not, you're not, I'm not going to throw down and say, no, you're wrong, or yay, you're right. What do you think? Raise your hand. Do you, raise your hand if you do think we have a guardian angel. Raise your hand if you don't think we have a guardian angel. Raise your hand if you're just not sure. Okay. That's all right. What is, what would you think is a guardian angel? What were you gonna say, Casey? It's like fairly odd parents, but without the wishes. Like fairly odd parents, but without the wishes. I'm going to take for granted that that's a good example and go, yeah, because I've never actually seen it. All right. Okay. So, do I have a guardian angel? Well, Scripture tells us that angels are sent for our protection. Scripture tells us angels are sent for our protection. Would someone read Psalm 91, 11, and 12 for us? Anyone want to go for it? Psalm 91, 11 through 12. And whenever you're there, just go ahead and start reading it. So we see that angels were given to protect. They were there. They're sent for protection. But some believe in a guardian angel for each individual. Now we know there are myriads upon myriads, thousands upon thousands, innumerable numbers of angels. We covered that last week. Some believe in a guardian angel for each individual. Let's look at what the the Scripture says. Uh, I can read Matthew 18.10. Who wants Acts 12.15? Go for it, Josiah. All right, I'll read Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. It says this, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So it says, their angels. Okay, what about Acts chapter 12, verse 15? It is His angel. There are some verses that make it seem like there is an angel that is there specifically as a guardian angel as kind of a one-on-one individual basis there. Now, I am never going to argue against an angel that maybe God has sent for a person for a particular time. Or that God strategically puts an angel in a place for a person for a specific time. But I'm not so sure 
that we can make the argument from Scripture, even with those verses, that there is an angel for every individual. Rather, I think it might be better to say that angels may be playing kind of a zone defense rather than man-to-man defense. You guys understand that reference? You guys get that? All right. That an angel is assigned to an area, and that angel assigned to that area will work with the individuals that are in that area. Does that make sense? Does that kind of help you all grasp maybe what it might look like a little more? All right. Okay, so that's going to lead us to this. I told, you, I told you that there are demonic forces, that angels are warring against demonic forces. So what are these demonic forces? What are fallen angels? What are they? They are demons. They're angels that have fallen. All right, sometime in between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3.1, there must have been a rebellion in the angelic world. All right, we don't know when exactly. We don't know, we don't know a lot of the details, but it had to have happened sometime in between because the serpent shows up at Genesis 3.1. Before Genesis 3, God looked at the world and everything was good. And He looked at after people were made and it was very good. If there had been the rebellion in the angelic world, probably would not have been given those terms. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Who wants that one? Go for it, Casey. And who wants Jude 6? Jonathan, read Jude 6. All right. Read for us whenever you get there. Second Peter chapter two verse four. Okay. For God not spare even the angels who sinned, be through little to hell, and it will be pissed off darkness. Oh. And where they are we come to the day of judgment. So these fallen angels rebelled against God and he threw them into darkness. What about Jude six? They did not stay in their proper dwelling. They left. They rebelled. They were at war against the things of God. And here's the thing, guys. It started with one angel who wanted a throne on high. Someone read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Go for it, Logan. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. And we're going to see how it started with one angel who wanted the throne on high. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, and how you are cut down from the ground, you who lay the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mountains of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself a good light and most high. But you are brought down. All right, this is talking about Satan. We, I won't, I'll get into this more next week, but when it, when it translates it there, and it says, excuse me, and it says, um, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. That is in uh, Aramaic, the word is, Hallel, you guys don't have to remember that. But it's translated in Latin, that word Hallel is translated in Latin as Lucifero. Which we get Lucifer from. Okay? So actually, Lucifer is not the name of Satan. Uh, Lucifer is a description of what Satan was like of what the devil was like. He was like the day star. Like the sun of dawn. How 
You are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. One angel decided to set his throne higher than God's. That one angel, that day star, that Lucifero, he rebelled and he was cast down. So we've looked at angels. We looked at the good side of it. Next week, we start taking a plunge into the darkness of what it looks like for these fallen angels. So next week, we're going to discuss this topic in a lot more detail. And understand this, Satan and demons, very different from what you might have seen or what you think of what's portrayed in popular uh, media. We pray for us, and then the band will come up and play. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love You, we praise You, we thank You for the time that we can be here. I ask God that You would bless this study. Father, not that we would be engrossed or impassioned or filling our thoughts solely or primarily about angels and demons, but that, Father, we would recognize that angels are created for Your glory. There are some who fell and they don't have a redemption story. But, Father, even in our fallenness, You have provided a means for salvation for even wicked sinners like us. Lord, I pray that this study, like every study we take of Your Scripture, would help us to consider Your salvation more deeply, appreciate it more greatly, and Father, that You would use this time to cause us to worship. It's in Your Son's name, Jesus, I ask these things and for His sake. Amen.